We are not responsible for your behaviour. We believe in common sense. This is the Strange But True radio podcast with Philip Keeler in the UK and Philip Jones and Elena in northern Spain. You're listening to News Talk, episode 36 of 2021. Hi, Philip. Hi, Phil. On tonight's podcast, in the UK, the government plans to ban LGBTQ conversion therapy. The UK leaving the EU will be worse on the economy than the pandemic. The British public will see a higher cost in living. We have details on Budget 2021. And across the world, people celebrate Halloween. But how many of us believe ghosts exist? Listen wherever you get your podcasts from, including Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music and Spotify. This is Strange But True Radio for a Mixed Up Generation. In the UK, the government plans to ban LGBTQ conversion therapy. Now, there's a six-week consultation taking place looking into the practice that many gay people find torturous and even dangerous. Many who have been through it say it has no impact in changing who they love, but does cause their mental health to suffer. So, Phil, um, why has it taken so long for the government to... Uh, try and ban conversion therapy. I think it's liberty of uh, expression, freedom of expression. We're entitled to say and say pretty much what we want to, subject to the limits of the Human Rights Act, which are basically no discrimination against uh, minorities, um, such as due to um, sexual orientation, um, gender, age is another one. Um, I can't remember, religious orientation, and there's one other thing, but basically we're not allowed to, dis- and race, that's the other one, which is very important. Um, we mustn't discriminate against people, and they regard this as a form of, uh, which is, this is not discrimination, it's an attempt to brainwash people, which is quite disturbing if, if you think about it. So it's very difficult to define um, how we can control people's language or how we express ourselves. And so they're moving into dangerous ground with this kind of law yeah. because we should be able to police ourselves on these matters. It's And even if they are, they're introducing a law which bans um, this kind of uh, brainwashing uh, for people under 18. So if you try and persuade someone that they're, they're not uh, LGBT, um, then they, if you try and do that, if they're under 18, that's that's illegal. If they're over 18, it's illegal if you haven't got consent. And um, it's also the government may take away people's passports if they are to suspect that someone may be sent abroad for this form of um, conversion therapy. And in addition to that, um, uh, if you if people are discussing conversion therapy on religious grounds at any age, I understand it as being legal. Okay, so there yeah. are restrictions. It's political in many ways <clears throat> to because of the fact that the LGBT voice is quite loud and they want to um, comply with those ideo- ideo- that ideology in these days. But this is a good thing that, you know, the government's coming heavy on. I know people, um, actually, I know one person in America who's had uh, conversion therapy, and it really mucked her up for a long time. And I think, it's very, I think it's a terrible thing. I think we should be able to police ourselves. I think it's very dangerous because if the government can turn around to somebody and say, we think you might send your child abroad for conversion therapy, then they can take the passport away. But that's a good thing, isn't it? No, not having the ability to remove somebody's passport. That's, that's terrible. Thing, Do you think really? they might might use that not for the, for that purpose though, but for something else? Is that what you're saying? Exactly. If they consider that somebody may be involved in terrorism or anything like that, they might be. They may not be, but it means the government have control, mm. and it's a removal of 
freedom is of a basic freedom. Mm. Do they take people? I don't know this, but I've never heard it advertised. But when you have um, female circumcision, do they threaten to take the passport away if they think somebody may be sent abroad to do that? I'm not sure they do. I've never heard of it before. I know it's illegal to do so. But women are sent. Young women are sent abroad for fem- for, for genital, effectively genital mutilation, which is horrific. Yeah. Absolutely horrific. But it still goes on. It goes on in our country. It goes on in secret. Doctors are paid a lot of money. A lot of some of these people who have it, who want this practice, who who, who want it done, are multi-millionaires. And everything they want. Mm. So where where do we where are we going with this? Why are they imposing this law now? Um, I think it's it's for political correctness more than anything else. But I'm also aware that they're eroding certain rights, and then this become this becomes um, a form of control. So in a, in a sense, if you if you want to control parents, they can say we can take your they can effectively on a suspicion remove the child's passport yeah so they can, if they want to they can just say oh well you know we think that that's why you're sending them abroad without necessarily we don't know whatever what the standard what standard of evidence is required for them to do that because it doesn't say i see your point and i understand i understand that um i uh, wanted to join um the king's church it's called the king's church i believe in eastbourne um the first question um, they ask people when you come through the door is who you sleep with. That's with, a bit personal, isn't it? Exactly. Um, and so I had an email uh, to and throw with the, 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 the chief person there. Um, and uh, he basically invited me out for coffee uh, to talk through uh, my experience of being gay and he was basically hinting that if I was uh, going to sleep with men, uh, then uh, or sleep with my uh, partner, actually now um, I would not be able to join the church. Well, that's discrimination on the grounds of sexuality, which I believe is illegal. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. I I couldn't be bothered to to chat talk any more to him, but. I just thought, hmm, it's really... It's very strange in, in, in the, day, the world today to, for that to even be considered, I think. And that's a very, very modern kind of church as well in Eastbourne. Well, they may say they are, but I mean, as we, we know, religion is, well, from my perspective, religion is a very, very, very good thing. But what is wrong with it is the way it's administered. And that sounds like exactly what i'm talking about it's, that's a wrong that's the wrong way of looking at it today mm. yeah it's, it's just one of those tricky things really i, I mean i personally as somebody who's a gay man i feel a lot safer with um them banning um uh, conversion therapy or trying to to stop it and it's just i know too many people who've who've been told to go to these places by their parents and have become really mentally ill for a few months afterwards while they find themselves again. It's really difficult when you come out in the first place and then somebody says, actually, you're, you're not that person. Go back in the closet and we're going to help you um, be um, what we term is normal, whatever normal is. I think that's a fair point. I agree with you. However, I would question as to whether or not the government should be able to remove the, someone's passport on suspicion of yeah. this. No, I, I think that's that's an interesting point, actually. You're with Elena uh, and you're in Spain. She's a Spanish local, isn't she? Um, what, she what, is. what, 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 what's LGBTQ uh, like in, in Spain? Is it a friendly place to live for people... I would say yes. ¿Qué piensas de la situación de la, 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 las lesbianas y las gays aquí en, en uh, España? ¿Es buena la, la gente, la actitud de la gente? ¿Es normal? ¿Es un problema o no es un problema? Es normal, yo, yo es más creo normal que, ahora, que Inglaterra. Sí. 
que ahora no, no es no problema. No hay problema, nadie, le, le da igual en efecto, es normal sí. si alguien... A ver, es... hay ciudades en las que la gente o las personas, los ciudadanos, son más reticentes, sí. pero en otras no, okay, pero sí. en general no. Generally, it's a very good place to be gay. Mm. That's good. It's well accepted. My, I mean, I've been coming here for a long time, and Elena substantiates exactly what I'm just about to say, really, that most everywhere you go in Spain, no one gives a monkey's doesn't matter. It's not a big deal because it's just accepted as a normal part of life that some people are gay and some people aren't. I mean, why shouldn't we think? Why do we have to make such a big deal out of it? As far as I'm concerned, I'm just, you know, I think it's just normal. I, can, I don't mind who, who's gay or not. It doesn't matter. She says some cities are a bit strange, have a strange attitude towards it. But generally speaking, it's just a normal thing. It's perfectly normal. That's good. Yeah, that's that's good I to hear. So uh, the UK government are having a six week consultation process over how to legislate over uh, the practice of uh, cohesive conversion. We'll uh, keep you up to date on that as the uh, the news breaks. Up next, we're going to be talking about um, the Brexit versus the pandemic. Uh, what is, which is, is which is worse? And uh, apparently Brexit is a lot worse. Phil's got more on that right after the break. Stay with us. Go to our website, strangebuttruradio.com, to get deals on Amazon Prime. Free delivery, free books, free movies, free music. If you go to our website now, you'll get a 30-day trial of Amazon Prime. The UK leaving the EU will be worse on the economy than the pandemic. That's according to the chairman of the Office for Budget Responsibility. Uh, Richard Hughes is his name. He said leaving would reduce our GDP by 4% 
in the long term. Um, Phil, that compared uh, to the pandemic, which stands at 2%, uh, both haven't done us uh, much good, have they? Why would the Conservative-led government lead us into Brexit when they knowingly knew it would make us worse off as a country? Well, there is a theory that offshore accounts had to be declared on the 31st, is it the 31st of January to 2020? So that's why a lot of, it seems, people with a lot of money knew that all their offshore accounts had to be declared by that date. Actually, funnily enough, it's exactly the same date that we left officially. <laughs> um, and that was why Rees Mogg, for example, has several offshore accounts. He runs hedge funds. He's got an office in Dublin mm. for one of his, so Brexit didn't affect his business. And a lot of these people who are incredibly rich just didn't want to declare how much money they've got and they didn't want to declare the fact that they're not paying any tax. So they they were, a lot of them were behind Brexit. Um, the other reason why we're behind Brexit, which is very interesting, is there was an American fighter pilot in, I believe, the early, in the 1950s, who created a form of battle which involves what you do is you orient you look you observe orientate yourself decide what you're going to do and then do what you've decided to do and this is a, how you fly a fighter plane right which is a form of battle which doesn't consider any form of consensus or the consequences of your actions can only be one thing the idea is to destroy what's in front of you okay now, this is the theory that Dominic Cummings employed when he wanted Brexit. He didn't. He looked at Brexit, the Brexit referendum, as a fight between Brexit and no Brexit. That's why he came up with get Brexit, take back control. Take that back control was a psychological form of, 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 of that appeals to people who thought who cre- creates the idea. We are no longer control. We no longer control our own laws. So that's very interesting that he did that. So he didn't really consider what the problem, the problems of Brexit were, and that's why. And also, it begs the question: If Richard Hughes, the chairman of the Office of Budget Responsibility, that's Budget Responsibility, he said that they predicted this. They predicted. So they would have known. They knew. Because, uh, you know, the, the no, government really know all of this. The, the British public who voted ha- have no idea. No, they didn't. They were lied to. I mean, I may have mentioned this before. Nigel Farage didn't... Everything Nigel Farage says is a lie, as far as I'm concerned. He, he makes up stories about the EU, about EU law. People think that the European Court of Justice affects all of our laws. It doesn't, it never has. Mm. It only affected the laws over which the EU presided. The European Union, for example, only presided over between 10 and 12% of our laws. Farage is just a meddler though, isn't he? Sorry, what? Farage is just one of those chaotic meddlers. He likes causing chaos. He was the reason why Cameron felt sufficiently threatened to have a referendum, apart from the fact that people in Whitehall were saying that when Cameron and his cronies got in power, they didn't have a clue what to do. Yeah, They were running around a bit like headless chickens thinking, what do we do now? What do we do now? I know, I've studied politics at university. They told us that if you want to retain power, have a referendum. The other thing you do is have a war. We didn't have a war, thankfully. Well, we do have several probably, but we're not told that much about them. Mm. Anyway, these things, Cameron was afraid of UKIP. He wanted to retain his popularity. He was very naive. He's a very naive individual as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And we really don't know what he's doing. And if you look at Boris Johnson and what Boris Johnson's doing, he wanted to um, win to be prime minister. So he knew that if he um, he was popular... He knew that if he undermined Cameron, then Cameron lost the referendum issue. Cameron would 
have to resign over it, which he did, which would open the door for a new prime minister. Now, buffoon boy Johnson and the black shirts, sorry, buffoon boy Johnson was in a club called the Bullingdon Club. They were pals at school. And it's a bit like a game of tennis. One had to win. And at that time, Cameron was winning. But buffoon boy Johnson wanted to win. So what he did, <laughs> the mind, the ideas that Cam, what Cameron had instigated in order to become Prime Minister because he, he always wanted to be Prime Minister so he got in, he did whatever he could politically to become Prime Minister and he succeeded now that doesn't mean that he knows anything about economy, economics it means that he knows how to manipulate politics in order to become a Prime Minister and you can see this by his policies because you see that everything he says or does is absolute nonsense. What a time it's, to become a prime minister in a in a pandemic, though. He must have taken that seat and thought, "Bloody hell! Now we've got a pandemic. Now I've got to really tr- sort of act like a prime minister." I don't think he did. I think he's so arrogant that he doesn't care about that type of thing. I think he's privileged. He believes that he deserves the position that he's in, especially if he is a narcissist, which he's very likely to be. Mm. Um, And narcissists are generally speaking very, very manipulative people uh, and uncaring about the consequences of their actions. And it means that they don't, the normal pressures and trials and tribulations that we live under, having um, some kind of empathy towards others, don't, don't apply to them. That's if Johnson is a narcissist which is very likely to be. Mm. And so this is a very interesting thing to look up, actually, if you're interested in psychology. It's fantastic to um, read up on narcissism um, and how it affects people and the, the, how it affects people, and in particular those people who are um, have relationships with narcissists and they f- may find themselves in a very disturbed situation um, in view of the, the actions of the narcissists that they know and possibly love, and they probably don't realise why they feel so disturbed. And if you think about it, the whole country is disturbed under the guidance of Boris Johnson, which would comply with the fact that he may be a narcissist. Well, wow. um, just quickly then, because this story is about GDP, um, and so there'll be a lot of people really that don't understand gross domestic product. In layman's terms, what is that? It's our turnover. It's how much business we do. It's how much the quantity of money that changes hands in our economy. So how much is bought and how much is sold. So the UK has 1,500 billion pounds worth of turnover. So 1,000 500 billion pounds worth of goods and services bought and sold within our economy. And um, a big chunk of that is uh, 1,200 billion of um, international trade, of which uh, about 45% of that was with the EU. Right. So the biggest trading partners. So if we put blocks or obstacles in the way of our, biggest, of our biggest trading partner, then obviously, it's blatantly obvious, it's going to cause massive economic problems. It's so obvious, it's like being slapped in the face, yeah. as, most of the peer, as most of the MPs should have known. Well, they should have known. If they didn't know, they shouldn't have been MPs. They all must have known. Personally, I'm not sure that Nigel Farage did because I don't think he's anyone with any intelligence. I think he's very vociferous and able to argue very strongly, but he's like it's a game of football again, similar lines to um, Dominic Cummings. But I find it all absolutely disgusting because these people are supposed to be representing us as a people and acting in our best interests, which they are clearly not doing. Very difficult, I think, uh, to for, for, uh, very difficult for the British public to understand all of this. I, you know, you, you're, you've got a bit more experience. I, I struggle to understand, but I just find it terrible that the government have just done Brexit and then all of this is unraveling, including uh, supply chain problems. Uh, they must have known about this. 
Oh, definitely, yes. What is it you do, you find most difficult to come to terms with? Just all the numbers and GDP, and just you know, I, I don't really, I don't really get that. And I, I would hold my hands up if I said I, I, I did know. Um, and you just think that the government yeah. would would help people understand, but they didn't. They just put slogans on buses and told us a load of rubbish to get us out of the EU. So we'll say if you're a builder and you want to buy a house or build a house, you go to a builder, you say, I want to build a house, that'll be 100, the builder says that'll be £100,000, and then from that £100, £1,000, he pays people wages. So first of all, um, the builder is paid £100,000, and from the £100,000, so there's £100,000 of turnover. Then he pays out to the, the labourers, say, £50,000, and he puts £50,000 in the bank. So the £50,000 he pays to the labourers is more turnover because it's a transfer of funds from one place to another. So if you imagine you have a whole economy and you have someone who transfers funds from one place to another, that's turnover. That turnover from what everybody does is added up when that turnover is added up, that's what's called GDP or gross domestic product. Okay. Now, part of that turnover may be imports and exports, which appears to be a big chunk. I did check the figures, and I'm quite surprised at how high they are. And they're saying that a big chunk of that turnover is buying and selling goods from overseas. So if you buy something from overseas, that's turnover as well. Wow. If you sell something, Sees that's turnover as well. So if you sell a hundred pounds worth of goods to France, and then France sell you eighty pounds of goods back, then that means you've added another hundred and eighty pounds to turnover, and that turnover is gross domestic product. And that's how they calculate it, and they work it out basically on ta- how I imagine on how much tax is paid. So they know they can calculate it because everybody has to declare their tax to the HMRC, and that's how they know how much it is. So that's how it works, basically, very, very basically. But it's crazy. I mean, New Zealand, which where they've been talking about, oh, we've got a big deal with New Zealand. New Zealand is number 43 on uh, number 43 of, um, of the, the biggest trading partners. So they come in number 43. The EU comes in at number one mm. with about 45%. And the United States comes in at number two with about... Um, 20 odd percent all, okay. always good all that nonsense they were talking about oh what we're going to get a new trade deal with the united states once we leave brett the eu is absolute rubbish because we had a fantastic trading deal with them before we left we have fantastic trading deals with other countries all created by the eu all of them and now wow. johnson johnson's come along and so that was all nonsense to try and convince us that everything was going to change after Brexit. No, it's just going to continue. Hopefully it's going to continue with our overseas trading agreements that we already had. But the most, a lot of the business that we'll do with say, for example, New Zealand, which we have um, a lot, a lot of it's agricultural and it doesn't protect our own farmers. So our own farmers will be harmed by the agreement that Boris Johnson has created with New Zealand and New Zealand New Zealand only have about two billion pounds worth of business with us, whereas um, the EU have about five hundred billion. Just to show you the difference, five hundred billion. Wow, that's fifty times as much. What a mistake we made. This is Strange But True Radio. He's Phil Jones in Spain. I'm Philip Keeler over in the UK. We are talking about Budget 2021, the UK's budget, next on Strange But True Radio.
Now, over on Twitter, on our Twitter account, you can find us stat uh, strange BTR. Uh, we broke the story of the first openly gay uh, top flight footballer in Australia coming out. His name, uh, Josh Cavell. Covello, sorry, uh, and he's an Adelaide uh, United player. He came out this week as uh, being gay. Um, later this week on Wednesday, uh, Tom and I, the Tom and Phil show on Strange But True Radio, we're going to be talking about that and how important it is for us to have uh, uh, openly gay footballers and uh, to, to just help people out there having good role models. So, um, yeah, if you want to listen to that, Tom and Phil show uh, will be uh, on air on Strange But True on Wednesday. Now, the British public will see a higher cost in living. We have details on budget 2021 next. Um, There were some good and bad measures announced by Chancellor Rishi Sunak, although Phil's probably going to say they're all bad uh, to me in a moment. Um... Rishi Sunak is the collector of Star Wars models and one of the very richest men in the country. Um, Phil, um, what did um, R2-D2, what did he announce? Rishi Sunak, actually, his budget is is quite... It's not as restrictive as, as I thought it would be. In fact, it doesn't really seem to change very much, which is quite unusual considering the amount of money he's just shelled out. Quite surprising. So what he said is basically eight different made eight different points in a nutshell. The first one is that if you are on um, universal credit, which I think just means benefits, as usual, they change these names because people are paid masses of amount of money to sit in offices in administration and have nothing to do, so they change names all the time just to confuse us all. And um, basically, he's uh, saying that. If you're on universal credit, you uh, get to keep um, 45p out of every pound you earn over a certain amount, whereas before you got to keep 37p. So that's a big change, really. That's a that's a fair change. It means that you're better off if you're on benefits and um, you start to earn some money. So that's that's helpful in a way because it encourages people to get back to work work because it's far more worthwhile because that's how much of your benefits you lose if you get my drift. And then secondly, um, he's put a fuse on freeze on fuel duty. So um, that means it's at 60%. So we every every time you buy a gallon or a litre of petrol it's, you pay 60% to the government, which is absolutely, which is a huge amount of money, really. It's, but they're free. They're saying they're going to freeze that, which what is what for me is very bizarre is why don't they make it 61% and then forget about road tax? And then you've reduced, all, you've lost all the admin costs for road tax. Road tax is completely and utterly pointless. People can, people have to go to court if they don't pay. You have a problem. You have massive computer systems to run it. You have uh, to spend time making sure you've got your tax. You have to apply for a refund. You have to get your refund back. You have to lose money in the event that you um, sell a car at a certain time of month. You don't get the full month back. And you have to pay. They do massive calculations to d- establish how much you're supposed to pay according to the amount of fuel you're supposed to use. So if you have a big car in the garage and you never use it, you still have to pay as though more money just because you own a big car. So why don't they just put increase, put 1% on the fuel tax and forget all about that? And all the people who are employed in that industry collecting car tax are freed up to do something useful like social care or whatever it may be, hmm. join the police force, go into the prison service, anything but collect tax because that's a complete and utter waste of time. But no one seems to address that. That's my pet eight, or one of my pet eights. Um, Now he said that the uh, living wage, which is really the minimum wage, has gone up by about 6.6% roughly across the board, which is quite good. Um, this the apprentice rate is very very low so that's not good because more people should be encouraged to go into apprenticeships because we are um, short on that 
on skilled labour. We people tend to go to university now and learn how to uh, work with computers. We need more people with practical skills, and I think wages will show that, and the cost of labour will increase. It is increasing. Uh, labour costs are higher than they used to be, and obviously we've got a problem with uh, people who skilled people uh, leaving the UK in view of Brexit because they don't feel happy to work here anymore and it's far more difficult for them to do so. So that's a problem. Can I just ask you about apprentice rates? I think, right, they're saying it's going to rise to £4.81. I wouldn't want to be an apprentice in a job for that. Don't you think it's big companies taking advantage of people? Well, yes, to a certain extent, but if they're they're only, they're very young people, they're only 16. So... You know they're going in. They, they know that they'll they'll work for food in effect, and they're not really producing anything because they are being trained. So in a sense, they're getting paid low wages because the company is spending money on their training. Okay. For them, so that they can earn money in the future. It's a bit like you know if you go to work in a law firm, they start you off at far less money than you would do when you've been working there for a long time it's the same principle really but if, so if you're very if you're very young and you're only 16 and you're going to just to be an apprenticeship or into an apprenticeship then um, that's how it works it's always worked like that so you know they're not expected to earn a lot of money really while they're in training okay. so then we move on it's a fair point though Phil I mean agreed um Alcohol change in Feb- 20- February 23, that's when he's going to increase taxes on alcohol and he's probably going to increase taxes on spirits and reduce and leave beer the same or reduce it or something like that. Something which is very weird was the Tories years ago took a couple of pence off a pint of bitter and because they took a couple of pence off a pint of bitter in tax, they lost 350 million income. They immediately took that 350 million off the budget that was normally paid to the judiciary. So the ju- it caused masses of problems in our legal system, and it meant that people were not didn't get as fair a trial as they might have done. Legal resources were reduced, and it affected justice in this country. So for a government that wants justice, they should be increasing funds to the judiciary, not reducing them. And that's exactly what the Tories did for the sake of three pence on a pint of bitter, which is utter madness. Yeah, yeah. So that kind of thing is a bit strange. That's why I think that people like Rishi Sunak should stick to playing with their Star Wars toys and get somebody real out there to apply these rules and regulations. The other thing, the next one is tax thresholds are frozen for up for five years, so they'll stay the same. But um, as they as inflation rises, because it is rising, they're anticipating an um, inflation of five percent, which is the highest that it's been for thirty years, and they're all going to blame. Um, they're going to blame uh, the pandemic, but the pandemic obviously isn't the main factor. The main factor is Brexit because they, they think that Brexit is going to be the biggest cause of inflation, which we can see nowadays, despite what the news say. Yeah. Um, all of our problems from Brexit are actually broadcast as problems from Brexit on the continent and elsewhere in the world. The only place that says it's the pandemic that's causing the problems are are the UK press, because obviously the UK press have an agenda and are manipulated by certain people who own them and are fans of the Tory party because they're getting a few favours. That's number five. National insurance has gone up by 1.25p in the pound, which is less than we anticipated, which isn't so bad, but it is going to affect, that is for people so that they can pay more into their pensions which I'm not sure, I think that doesn't really worry me in the slightest, that type of thing, um, although it is an increase, it's an increase in what people call direct tax, and econom- economists would call that indirect tax, because direct tax is VAT. Anyway, that's a debatable point, I suppose. Um, then we move on, airport taxes for long-haul trips are going to go up, So that and short-haul um, local trips you know, if you want to fly to Basingstoke or something, they're going to go down. Rather and not. Then, <laughs> why not? It's a lovely place. Lovely. Basingstoke's lovely. So, uh, tax levy, the seven, number seven is going to be 
a tax levy on the biggest developers to pay for the removal and replacement of dodgy cladding, which I think they've got little or no choice in doing that. They're saying that only the tax the tax levies on the biggest developers, fair enough. I suppose if you're a smaller developer, you can't afford it. And also, if you've put the dodgy cladding on, the, on in the first place, um, in view of the fact that uh, you wanted to save money and risk people's lives, that's capitalism for you. So you should have to pay for that. Um, nonetheless, I think they're doing this because a lot of people have found themselves in a dreadful situation because if they have got dodgy cladding on their building, they can't sell their properties. They're into negative equity. Yeah. Just can't. Yeah. So that's that. Hopefully, that'll help some people. So that's not a bad thing at all. Um, and also, they're talking about um, support for new parents. So that's so that um, they can be educated in how to run their lives, which is a form of control, but actually quite useful. You know, they want to help people with their numeracy skills. They've come up with the amount of, if you're bad at managing your own house, it can cost you as much as £1,600 a year in waste, which is ridiculous because how on earth could you possibly calculate it? They've pulled that number out of the sky, it could come from anywhere. Yeah. I do Oh, for a fact, though, that a lot of advertising does manipulate people's decisions and people tend to spend money on things that they can't afford because they're they're kind of uh, persuaded to do so, make, to make themselves feel better. They think if they go and spend lots of money, they'll, they'll go to a shop and the shop will say, yes, we'll give you loads of credit, or you get a credit card with 30% um, APR, which is a huge amount of money for a credit card, but they hand them out, you know, like sweeties, that kind of thing would it'd be better to control that kind of free enterprise. You know, I don't know if you remember the short term loans where they were charging a hundred percent a year for people who couldn't afford to take a loan. That was very bad, and they did put they did knock that on the head after a while. But that was a, a terrible situation. It never should have arisen. But as I say, these huge amounts of interest that are charged on credit cards shouldn't be allowed because they do screw people up. Screw the, the people who haven't got massive incomes and have got loads of kids or whatever. We sh- they should be um, they shouldn't be bombarded with all this yeah. this, this this shiny stuff that they don't need um, to waste their money on. Yeah. So that's. That's, that's a good thing as well. So all in all, quite a good budget, I think, for many people. I never thought I would hear you say that, but uh, there we go. It's not so bad. It's not so bad, really. Um, I don't know where Mr. Sunak and his chums think they're getting all the money from. No. But um, not to increase taxes they've done. I think it's pretty good. It could, it could have been a, an awful lot worse. But, I mean, it could have been a lot better if they hadn't wasted... 50 billion, that's 50,000 million pounds that have disappeared. 37,000 million pounds has disappeared on test and trace that nobody uses, which is phenomenal. That's a massive amount of money. I mean, you can build an, uh, a railway from London to Birmingham for that amount of money. Yeah. So where's it gone? Where is it gone? I've asked my MP and I'm still waiting to hear. He told me, oh, we've got, this is where 176 million has gone. And I said, so we've answered your question. I said, hold on a minute. You've, what about the other 48,000 million? Where's that gone? Well, 48,800 million. Where's that gone? There seems to be an error in your judgment here. And another thing he said was, They've produced 3.2 billion. This is actually in a letter that I've got. It said they've produced 3.2 billion items of PPE during the pandemic. That's 500 items per person in the UK. I've only used about three. So I don't know what the rest of them are. It's just rubbish. I mean, how, how stupid do they think I am? It's very insulting the way these guys refuse to answer my questions because mm. I don't like to answer the, ask their questions. When, then, when I get the next reply, I'll let you know what they say. But it's all a bit dodgy as far as I'm concerned. If they if they were doing the right thing, they'd just be able to say, oh, this is where the money's gone. But at the moment, no, they can't. And there's a people called the Good Law Project who are investigating the government at the moment. And they've asked them for um they've asked them asked for the information as to where this money's gone and the government said we don't have to give you that information because it's not in the public interest to do so 
hold on a minute, it's our money. So the Good Law Project went to the judiciary and the judiciary said, yes, you've got to tell them where it's gone. So let's see what happens. I'll, I would be surprised if the BBC forget to announce that. Ooh, maybe they haven't announced it at all. But um, we'll see what happens when that news comes out. I should get an email from the Good Law Project with a bit of luck. And if you're interested, look up the Good Law Project and um, they will, I'm sure, tell you of all the good things that they've done. And some of those are having convictions made against Michael Gove, um, Hancock, um, and oh, who else was nicked? Uh, there was someone else. There was a there was a couple of other Tory cabinet members who were nicked for unlawful conduct whilst in public office, and nothing was done. They just said, "Oh well, doesn't really matter, does it?" Mm. It's only unlawful conduct while while in public office. In fact, they should have been sacked. But um, I don't think that's on the buffoon or Johnson and the Black Shirts agenda. This is Strange But True Radio. He's Phil Jones in Spain. I'm Philip Keeler here in the UK. We're going to be talking about Halloween next.
If you want to contact the show, you can do very easily via email news at strange but true radio.com and actually the better email to use actually is studio at strange but true radio.com that goes uh, directly to phil and i right across the world people are celebrating halloween this week but how many of us believe ghosts exist a recent YouGov survey in the us and the uk shows that between 30 to 50 percent of us believe ghosts are real a belief in ghosts are also appears to be global with uh, most cultures widely accepting it so uh, phil i've got to ask you first of all do you believe in ghosts Yes, I think I do. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. yeah. There's some spirits that move around in this world. Definitely. No doubt. Too yeah. much evidence. Too, there's too much evidence available to that effect. Uh, do, do you, uh, why do you think that people believe in ghosts it, and it's part of our culture? Because they've been around sort of from the beginning of time. There's an excellent article, right, series of programs on BBC Sounds about an apparition that arrived in Battersea. And this um, poltergeist was doing all manner of things like moving things around the house and all other, other things. And this went on for years. And it's a fantastic program. And the evidence available, according to this story that happened, I think, in the 1950s in Battersea, um, is is well known and it's well worth listening to. And there is, there's lots of other evidence. I have a friend who's a clairvoyant, and she tells me the most amazing things that she couldn't possibly have known because she gets messages. I mean, I know her. I've known her for years and years, and she's certainly not lying to me. It's not like going to a show she just sends me messages occasionally. She sends me or phones me up and occasionally and says, did you know this? Because I found this out. And I think, how did you know that? Um, an example would be that, say, for example, she said someone was standing next to her mother wearing dungarees. And the only people, nobody wore dungarees in, in the 1950s in the UK, except my Uncle John. And as soon as I said to mum, do you know anyone who wore dungarees? She said, yeah, Uncle John. <laughs> and I said, well, how would she know that? I mean, that's yeah. totally bizarre. But let me tell you, where I am staying at the moment in northern Spain, they dug up the swimming pool and they found some human remains. And there's a big house next to that. So I'm, I'm on a farm and the farm has two chalets of two cottages each and there's a big house. So in the big house I've slept in before and it has a kind of a strange atmosphere that does make you feel uneasy. So um, before lockdown, Elena and her friend, her boyfriend or El su marido, um, which is a little bit more than boyfriend, I would say, um, <laughs> staying in the was staying in the in the in the, one of the bedrooms in the house. I have no um, idea what he said, dear listener. I hope it's not rude. No, it's not rude. No, it's a lovely house. It's absolutely marvelous. It's very, very well, um, well made. Well, you know, it's just a really nice house. It's, it's fabulous. It's got all the furniture, oil paintings, you name it. Fantastic kitchen. Absolutely immaculate. Huge library really nice place but there's something odd about it and when I stayed there I felt as though I should say something you know have a word with God to protect me while I was sleeping there because I felt sleeping there on my own I did feel a little bit uneasy and there was it was it's very cold anyway when Elena and our, her su marido were staying there um, they were in in the, one of the bedrooms I, I have to say not in the kitchen but in one of the bedrooms they, there was bangs on the table like this. This happened. Wow. On all the occasion. And I'm just going to ask um, Elena to say, tell me exactly what happened when she was sleeping with su marido. ¿Qué pasó cuando estabas en cama con Alfredo? Pues que sentí como le zarandeaban o como alguien o algo le movía. Fuertemente, she said when she was her boyfriend was asleep with her in the bed in one of the bedrooms she looked up, she woke up and there was something was moving rocking him backwards and forwards in bed rocking him just like moving him and he, he was asleep totally asleep he didn't wake up something was moving him wow. in the same 
place where they heard these sounds like this. Okay, now the other thing, so it moment, one moment, it kept us, que hiciste después? Tuviste demasiado temor. Mucho miedo, sí. Y yo no me moví. Yo estaba de lado. Sí. Y no fui capaz de mirar. Okay, momento. And she said, so it was, she was so frightened that was, I think anybody would be, me included. Um, she just lay on her side and faced in the other direction because she was too afraid to do anything. Did he have and his clothes on, ask her? No, she didn't see anything. No, did, but she, did, did her, her partner have his clothes on? Estaba llevando ropa. No, no, no. No mucho. Que se lleva. Pajamas, Phil. Okay. He was wearing pajamas. Okay. And um, uh, yes, but she couldn't see a, a spirit. It was just that he was being rocked backwards and forwards in bed. I mean, my mum's uh, aunt was a medium, and she, when she was in bed, this one of the spirits used to rip all the bedclothes off her. Wow. For example. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I mean, no. So there's there's all sorts of things that go on in the world about these poltergeists and spirits come along. And I mean, I don't know if you've ever had a spiritual experience. I mean, I've felt huge amounts of energy come into my body from seemingly nowhere, which yeah. is over my whole, whole being. Yeah. I've been, you know, I talk to God sometimes because I like to have a chat with him. And one time I remember... It was a bit of a time of trouble, and this huge, massive energy just passed throughout my whole body. Amazing, yeah. amazing feeling. And that's happened to me on more than one occasion. So, I, you know, I think that there is, there is a world that we're not entirely, we don't have any un, much understanding of, and some people have more understanding than others. I have, really yeah, and I've, ha I've had that same, like, uh, shivering down your back feeling uh, when, when something horrible, really sad and has happened to you, and you suddenly get energised. It's quite an interesting feeling, and then suddenly you feel sort of happy again. Very, yeah. <clears throat> very strange. This, this was a massive... For me, it was massive energy passing through me. And uh, as I say, um, this has happened on more than one occasion. Um, I was praying with some people at church, at a, at, uh, in a private situation at, at a church, and it happened to all of us in the same group at the same time, which was absolutely amazing. And actually what was quite interesting was I was um, – listening to uh, a podcast, in fact, an interview on, a very interesting interview on YouTube uh, of, the, one of the former most uh, violent criminal of the UK and how he ended up going to the chapel um, in prison because he realised by mistake and then he continued to go because he, they said, well, you'll get free tea and biscuits with chocolate, which is an absolute luxury. And so he said, he said one day after he realized, after he went to speak to the chapel and the, and the, and the, and, and the priest, he said to God, if you exist, well, do something. And he did. And he felt this amazing feeling come over him and he became religious and he turned into a Christian and it's turned his life around completely, which I think is absolutely fantastic. And I also believe that we, you know, Even if you don't believe in God, you could still believe in a good code of conduct, which is, is, is written by many religions, which are pretty similar. And as a good code of conduct, for some bizarre reason, if you uh, act in a good way to your fellow man, then good things happen to you. And okay. It's, it's very strange. Um, you know, we're talking about the Battersea poltergeist. I've found details on that. Um, it was presented by Danny Robbins of uh, Radio 4. And uh, you can listen to that on the BBC iPlayer on uh, Radio 4. So take a look at that, dear listener. It's about the uh, haunting of number 63, Wycliffe Road in Battersea. It's a fascinating, it looks like a fascinating story. This happened over a 12 year period. So uh, take a look, like, look at that. I'm going to um, listen to that in the car later today, I think. It's fantastic. It's, it's gripping. You just want to listen to all of them. I listen to every single episode. It's marvellous. <clears throat> yeah, I... 
I'm, I'm just trying to think of whether I've seen a ghost. I've been on these ghost haunts with uh, different groups and I've seen orbs and I've been able to um, move orbs from left to right by asking them to, to, to do that. And that's that's quite an interesting thing. And, and, and as a kid, I used to uh, see this lady, a German lady dressed in red, and I would stand in my cot and talk to this lady who uh, my parents couldn't see but i could see very easily uh and she would say things like liebchen in german to me which is my love and that is my ghost experience that's amazing they say that poltergeists are able to communicate with children whereas they might not communicate with adults and they normally um, adopt a child as their medium of exchange Mm. incredible I don't remember much of that now, but I, uh, I, yeah, I, I do remember talking to this this lady in in sort of a German language. Amazing. That's it for this edition of Strange But True Radio News Talk for a Mixed Up Generation with Philip Jones and Philip Keeler and Elena. Thank you very much. Thank you. Join us each and every Saturday evening for a new podcast to download on trending stories of the week. Available to download from 20 hundred hours British time. Take care of yourselves. We are not responsible for your behaviour. We believe in common sense. Here in Spain, they celebrate something called Holy Ween instead of Halloween because Holy Ween is the celebrate or celebration of All Saints Day. And um, it's quite a solemn situation and consists of telling stories and virtues of the saints, which I think is quite a nice thing instead of a massive American party. Well, if you want your news, that's strange but true. Look, they're all right, aren't they? Really?